I've seen that a number of times, and <clears throat> it's really, um, man is right. It's a gift. It's a gift to those boys. It's a gift to the people that work with Hope for Life, and it's a gift to all of us to participate. I know that it can feel like you're just writing a check from a, from a distance, but I hope you heard Amanda's words. The work wouldn't get done if God wasn't bringing all these things together all around the world. What a gift it is for us. And so when Amanda came to us and said, we have a vision to double our capacity, how do you say no to that? How do you say no? So we just felt immediately we need to say yes to this. This is what God's doing. And it's our, as you heard a moment ago when Tom and Gretchen told us, it's our, it's our project uh, for Advent. So if you give to serve the world, if you have or if you do this whole month, including Christmas Eve, all that money goes directly to Hope for Life until we raise the $65,000. And then once we're beyond that, if we grow beyond that, that money will be given to our other Serve the World partners as well, just so you know that. And, and again, that's up to you, but we encourage you to pray about what God would have you do uh, to bless Amanda and the boys at Hope for Life to double their capacity. I love when she said, we have a house full of healthy healed boys and other boys are finding their way to Hope for Life. And what do you do to take care of them? Well, we're going to help them do something that they couldn't do otherwise. So I want to say a good morning. Welcome, especially to those over at our South Street campus who are joining us and watching this. We're glad that you're with us on this, the third Sunday of Advent. We're going to jump in in a few minutes here to God's Word, but let's pray and ask Him to bless us before we do. Father God, thank you for stories like Amanda's story, which seems far away, but you are giving hope for life right here in our hearts, in our church and all the way over in Rwanda. And so, Lord Jesus, you who are our hope for life, we ask you to speak to us through your word this morning, because we really need to hear it. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, I, I have two younger sisters, and uh, when I was growing up, um, I had all girl cousins on both my mother's and my father's side. So when Aaron and I got married, and we found out uh, after we'd been married for a few years that she was pregnant with the first grandchild, there was a little pressure I felt to have a one to carry on the Fraser name. And my gra the, you know, the good Scottish clan name Fraser. My grandfather was concerned that we would have a boy. And uh, you'll see a picture here on the screen of my uh, four generations of Fraser men. It's my dad and my grandfather, and I know that's hard to believe, but that actually was me. And that's baby Noah, who's 22 now. Can you believe that? And I'm very grateful for that picture because it reminds me of the legacy of a father. I've been given a great gift in my dad. My dad was the best man in my wedding. I, my grandfather was the source of wisdom and joy and fun in our family. And I'm, I, I praise God for the legacy of faithfulness in the fathers in that image. Now, I know many of you don't feel as fortunate. Some of you do. Some of you dads in here and, uh, and those of you that aspire to be dads someday or some of you moms and, and you come from a great legacy of fathers and you should praise God for that. To all of you dads out there who have children, you're leaving a legacy. Even if you didn't grow up with one, you're leaving one for the future. But I know some of you, that's not true. You have, um, you have a little more pain when you think about your father, grandfather, or lack thereof whether it was dysfunction or abuse or absence. The father's legacy is something that's not easy for you to remember. Maybe you've suffered some loss, loss of a child even. We're going to examine here this morning in our series, uh, He Shall Be Called, the spiritual legacy we all have in Jesus Christ. Regardless of your background, your family, your past pain, or, or your past blessings. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we share a spiritual legacy in him. And it's a rich one. And we're doing that by looking at these four names, which you heard a moment ago in the Advent reading from Isaiah chapter 9. Four names given to the son that will be born. Let's look at Isaiah 9. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. We've read this every week of this series, but I don't think we can hear it enough because there's so much here for us. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelled in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, 
as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, over the past few weeks, we've dug into the context, the background in that passage. If you missed any of those sermons, they're available for you online or on the church app. You can go back and listen to those if you'd like. We won't get into that. Uh, we won't have time for that this morning. It's the whole point here is that Isaiah is talking to a people that are living in darkness, darkness marked by spiritual confusion and by political, military, and social threat. They're in literal darkness and moral, spiritual darkness. And his solution, God's solution to this darkness and confusion and brokenness is to send a son, a child to be born. And we have to know who this child is. This is so crucial for you and for me, not just this time of year, but in all seasons, to know who this is, which is why it, it matters that you dig into these four names. This is not cute, sentimental baby Jesus in a manger. Maybe, that's, maybe you're coming back to church now and it's been a while. This is Advent season. And that's how you think of it, sentimental. This is wonderful counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The name we're going to focus on uh, is, of this, is this third name, the Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. Now, right away, if you were listening closely and paying attention, you probably have the question, how can the Son to be born be the Everlasting Father? How is that possible? How can the Son to be born be the Everlasting Father? How does that work? How can a son, I mean, all fathers are sons, biologically speaking, of someone, but how is the son going to be born, be the everlasting father? All right, first of all, it's important to point out that Isaiah is not confusing the roles in the Trinity here. We're going to do a little theology this morning. I know that some of you are like, this is awesome. Others of you are like, I'm just trying to go to church. I'm not trying to do theology, but where else are you going to get this? And we're locking the doors so you can't leave, and we're going to get into it. Uh, because it's really important that we understand this. The Bible does not teach, and Christians do not believe, that Jesus is the Father or the Father is Jesus. Now, you might be scratching your head a little bit, and uh, hang with me. Uh, the Trinity is a brain buster, and that's, it has been for centuries. We're not going to unpack it all and get it perfectly understood this morning, but we're going to try to do a little bit of work here. Let me, you'll see an, an image here on the screen, which is a, a diagram of the Trinity. Now, some of you may have seen something like this before. This is, there, there is no perfect analogy of the Trinity, by the way. Like, for example, some of you might have heard this. Well, the Trinity is like a, like a shamrock. Three leaves, but one leaf, right? No, no, that's not right. Or maybe you've heard, well, it's like uh, ice, steam, and liquid. Like three, three different forms, but one, one element. No, not exactly. That's called modalism. That's a heresy we'll talk about later. Or maybe it's like me. I'm a father, I'm a son, and I'm also a husband. I've got different roles, but I'm one being, kind of, but again, not really. Christians have, be have believed and taught, because the Bible teaches, that God is one being with three persons. So the Son is God. The Spirit is God. The Father is God. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. Clear? Right? <laughs> now you probably go, how is that possible? Right. God is so far beyond you. We're talking about the Almighty God here, maker of heaven and earth. There's no possible analogy that we could come up with which would perfectly explain him. But we have to take what Scripture teaches, which is he's one being, one essence, three persons. In fact, you can go away from that now. Some of the, uh, the great creeds of our faith were developed to, to sort this out. In fact, how many of you know, have heard of the Nicene Creed? Maybe you grew up reciting the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed, you know what? That, that happened at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. 
And in 325 AD, the primary thing they were dealing with, among others, was with a biggie, was who is Jesus? Is Jesus God or is he a God? Is he divine? Like, is he the Father, like the Father, or the same substance as the Father? Or is he similar and different? Or is he a created being? And there was a guy there named Arius who believed that Jesus was divine, but not on the same level as the Father. That he actually was a created being. And we read in the Nicene Creed, I'll read it for you, that we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. And then there's this line in the Nicene Creed, of the same essence as the Father. That's so crucial. This is really fun for you history geeks. In 325 AD, at the Council of Nicaea, they spent over two days fighting over one Greek letter. The word in Greek, homoousios, means of the same substance. It's what that line means, of the same essence as the Father. The word in Greek, homoousios, means of similar substance. The, the Greek letter I, between homoousios and homoousios, that one letter changes everything. It changes the understanding of who is Jesus from he's similar to God to he is God, of the same essence, one being. And Arius was fighting that he was not the same as God. And do you know who was at the Council of Nicaea? Saint Nicholas, Bishop of Myra. You'll see a picture of him here. He looks like a friendly guy. This is not, this is the, the real Saint Nicholas. This is not Santa, different guy. But he was there uh, at the, at the uh, Council of Nicaea, and this is legend. We don't know if it's true or not, but I, I like to pretend it's true. It's a great Christmas story. That St. Nicholas was so offended by Arius' heresy that Jesus wasn't God that he walked across the room and punched him in the face. <laughs> so St. Nicholas gives presents, and he punches people who are heretics, right? <laughs> no, no, don't, don't, don't tell your kids that, right? But, but, but the point is, this whole council is, who is Jesus? Isaiah is giving us four names for the son to be born so that we would know exactly who this is. And it's crucial we get that right. Many get it wrong. Cute baby in a manger. Good example for us. Wise teacher. Someone to follow his lead. No. God from God, light from light, very God from very God, mighty God, wonderful counselor, everlasting father. How can the son to be born be the father? How is that possible? This might, for some of you, sound a lot like a, a, a whole lot of fuss over nothing, but it's not. It's crucial. So, for example, uh, I've used this example before. Pastor Brian, you all know Pastor Brian. You know what he's like. And what if I told you that I'm going to write a book about Pastor Brian, and in my book about Pastor Brian, he's going to be a seven-foot-tall redhead guy with freckles. You'd say, well, that's weird, but it's not him. Well, it doesn't matter what, if it's him, because that's how I like to think of him. That's who he is to me. So that's what he's going to be in my book. You'd say, well, you can't do that. There's an objective reality to who Pastor Brian is. You can't just decide he's different than he is. If that's true about a human being, how much more true is it about God himself? You can't just decide who he is for yourself. He's revealed himself to us. He's made himself known to us. We're not free to tinker with that. That's why it matters who's lying in that manger, who this son is to be born. Now, Isaiah is not describing his role in the Trinity when he says that Jesus is everlasting father, he shall be called everlasting father, because that would be a heresy. We saw that a moment ago. He's not messing that up. He's, he's describing, I don't think Isaiah had the Trinity in mind at all. What he's describing is the character of the son. His posture or attitude toward us is father-like. He's revealing to us the heart of the father. The New Testament writers pick up this theme in many, many places. Colossians 1.15, we read this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus himself says in numerous places that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. And in John 10, verses 30 and 31, there's this interesting little encounter when he says to the Jewish leaders, the religious experts, I and the Father are one. And the next verse, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. They were just 
anger. What's their deal? <laughs> really? Why? They? they know what he's saying. This, to them, this is a human being claiming to be God of one substance with the Father. How dare he? In other words, do you want to know what God the Father is like? Does he seem mysterious and far off and hard to understand? Do you want to know what the heart of the Father is like? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. He came to reveal to you and to me what the Father is like. What is God like? By the way, this means the God of the Old Testament is not at odds with the God Jesus of the New Testament. Some people grow up thinking that, or maybe you think that, like, you know, the God of the Old Testament seems angry, he seems like he's having a bad day all the time, he's grumpy, he's out to get people, he's doing things that are almost, like, unspeakable. Like, I like Jesus, because he seems nice. <laughs> it's the same essence, one substance. Jesus comes to reveal to you the heart of the Father, which should tell you the God of the Old Testament is far more loving and gracious than you maybe know, and Jesus, Jesus has more of an edge to him than the sweet little baby in the manger. Jesus repeatedly emphasizes his unity with the Father, and he shows us the heart of the Father. So I want to examine three ways in which Jesus, the Son, reveals to us the Father. First, the birth of the Son shows us the patience of the Father. The birth of the Son shows us the patience of the Father. Now, when Isaiah writes this prophecy, it's going to be 700 years plus before Jesus is born. And 400 of those 700 years are marked by total silence, no word from God at all to God's people. There's some waiting going on. There's some wondering, have you forgotten us, God? Where are you, God? Why are you silent, God? Don't you see our condition, God? In fact, you see the same waiting when they're, exiled, when they're in Egypt, in captivity, the slaves, the Israelites, when they're in captivity in Babylon. In fact, you could make the argument that the whole Bible is a story of God's people waiting on God to deliver. You ever feel like you're waiting on God? You ever feel like you're saying, where are you, God? Do you see what's going on here, God? You're in good company, friends. God's people have always been waiting on him. And we don't like waiting. Waiting is not fun. We think if we have it now, we'll be happy and fulfilled, or at least if we have it soon. But the message of Advent and of the gospel is waiting is in God's time. It's for your greater character and greater joy. This past week, my daughter turned 21, which is crazy. And we went to take her out to dinner. She's at a college not far away, and, and uh, she's a basketball player there, so she had, we had to wait till after practice and after films, and we would, uh, way after I would normally eat dinner, and we had to drive to pick her up and her teammates and, and go out to dinner. And we made reservations. We can't make reservations at this place we went to. You have to call ahead. So I found out, call an hour ahead. You'll be, certainly we'll be able to seat you if you call an hour ahead when you get here, which we did, 70 minutes, just so you know, ahead, I called. And we got there, and they did not have a table for us. The lady said, well, they're done eating, but they've ordered drinks. We're waiting for the table upstairs. And so we're standing in the aisle where all the servers are going by, and we're holding gifts, and it's all her friends, and it's me, and I'm just so irritated. I'm looking at my watch, and I'm wondering, how, we're not going to be seated for however long, and why aren't they having, and this is going to take longer, and it's past my bedtime, and on and on. So I went upstairs. The, the table was upstairs. I went upstairs. At first I talked to the server. She's like, well, what can I do, sir? We only have two large tables, and they'll, they'll vacate soon. So then I went upstairs like to look around. Which of the large tables, okay, they have their food. Those people don't have their food. It's those people. And they were all older people. And they had ordered drinks after dinner. And I stood there like this. <laughs> like they're going to know, what's that guy's problem, you know? Like, like staring at them would make them feel uncomfortable and leave or something. I don't know. I'm there to enjoy my daughter who's downstairs talking to my wife and her friends. And I'm so impatient. I don't like waiting. It was like God was giving me a little tap on the shoulder. Why don't you go back downstairs and engage with your daughter, with the reason you're here. Stop staring at people and bothering them while they're trying to have their meal. <laughs> Maybe you've got your own stories. We live in a world sick with hurry and anxiety and impatience. And you know that as well as I do. In our culture, more than ever, we need to know that our Father is patient. Patient with you. Patient with me. I want to be more like him, but I confess to you that I'm not. 
I remember telling a young couple that came for premarital counseling. They were new to our church, and they had been living together, and they were uh, growing in their faith and discovering who God was, and they came for premarital counseling, and I asked them if they were living together, and they said yes, and that's not uncommon today, I know. I said, I'm going to give you a challenge. I want you to move out. I want you to not live together for the, for the next six months before your, your wedding day. And they looked at me like I was speaking a foreign language. Like, that, that's crazy. I said, listen, I'm not the police. I'm not going to come check up on you, you know, peering in your window. That's weird. The pastor's not going to do that. I'm just giving you a challenge. Honor God. Move out. Trust him. And they did. Mostly she did. He had to go along with it. <laughs> but it, months after their wedding, they, they told me how much that meant to them, how much God taught them in the waiting. How even though they didn't start right, they could get it right. Waiting is hard. We don't like it. But the birth of Jesus, the Son, shows us that the Father is patient with us and he's patient for us. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. We read these words. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all, that all should reach repentance. He's not slow the way you think of slowness. Do you ever see the Lord of the Rings when Gandalf shows up? A wizard is never late, Bilbo Baggins, nor is he early. He always arrives precisely when he means to. Well, Gandalf is like Jesus in that way. <laughs> it's not late, he's not early, he's right on time. We are the ones wrestling with the waiting. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to save us from our sins. He knows the fullness of time in your life and in mine and in this world. The perfectly timed birth of the Son, our Savior, shows us the great patience of our Heavenly Father. Don't make the mistake, friends, of thinking that because you're having to wait that God has forgotten you. It is not true. Isaiah's telling us that. To the people walking in darkness, waiting, wondering, they have seen a great light. Second, the death of the Son shows us the grace of the Father. Now, this might sound like a strange thing to bring up a week before Christmas, the death of the Son. Like, that's the downer. Why are we talking about that? I like the birth. I like baby Jesus. I don't like the one on the cross. That's yucky, right? Like, we, but you, you, you wouldn't say it that way, but there's people that we feel this way, right? In fact, I think our culture has embraced Christmas in a way that it has, has not and will not embrace Good Friday or Easter, there's a harder, rougher edge to that. But Christmas is nice. Who doesn't love that? But it's so crucial. I'll put it this way. Don't do Christmas without the cross. It's meaningless. It's just superficial stuff and sentimental cultural celebration. Don't do Christmas without the cross. The birth of Jesus isn't really good news isn't joy to the world unless you have the Savior on the cross. The Son came not just to be born, but to live and then to die so that you and I might have access to the grace of the Father. Now, I, there's a lot of debate about the cross and the atonement and Jesus' sacrifice for us. There are those who want to remove that from the Christian faith. I want to say, you know, he died as an example of, of giving yourself up for others. How is that helpful? Our issue is not, your issue is not that you need an example to follow. You've got lots of those, but you don't follow them. Why? The Bible says because we're broken and we're sinful. What we need is someone to forgive us, to redeem us, to pay the price for us. The death of the Son shows us the grace of the Father. Romans 8, verses 31 to 32, the Apostle Paul says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now listen to this. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He who, God, the Father, who did not spare his own son. Listen, I love you as my church family, but 
but I do not think I would sacrifice my son for you. And you might think, I'm not asking you to. But do you understand the love of the Father? Do you understand what the death of the Son shows you at the heart of the Father? His grace, His great, immeasurable, amazing, life changing grace. This is love, right? Not that we love God, but that He loved us. Well, what does that look like? And sent His Son as the atoning sacrifice for our sin. That's how you know what love is. The, great, the death of the Son shows us the grace of the Father. Don't do Christmas without the cross. That's how you know the measure of God's grace to you. What kind of father is God? The son shows you. He's patient and he's gracious. You know, most of the Christmas songs that we love are silly. <laughs> but some of the good Christian ones, they, they, the best ones, Joy to the World and Hark the Herald Angels Sing. If you go look up the words to those, I encourage you to do that this week. They get at the resurrection no Christmas song that I could find except for one really talks about the cross. It's an old hymn called Who Is He in Yonder Stall? Uh, it's written um, in 1866 by a guy named Benjamin Russell Hanby who only lived 34 years and wrote 500 hymns in 34 years. And here's how it goes. Who is he in yonder stall at, at whose feet the shepherds fall? Tis the Lord, a wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Who is he in deep distress, fasting in the wilderness? Who is he the people bless for his words of gentleness? Who is he to whom they bring all the sick and sorrowing? Who is he that stands and weeps at the grave where Lazarus sleeps? Who is he the gathering throng greet with loud triumphant song? Lo, at midnight, who is he that prays in dark Gethsemane? Who is he on yonder tree, dies in grief and agony? It's, he's got it right. Yonder stall to dying on the cross. But the hymn doesn't stop there, nor does Isaiah's vision stop there. Let me read the rest of the hymn. Who is he who from the grave comes to succor, help, and save? Who is he who from his throne rules all the worlds alone? Tis the Lord a wondrous story. Tis the Lord the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. That's who's in the manger. That's why this matters. So let me just, lastly, the resurrection of the Son shows us the love of the Father. So the birth of the Son shows us how patient the Father is with us. The death of the Son shows us how gracious God is to us. And the resurrection of the Son shows us how loving the Father is. Paul says that the resurrection, Christ is the first fruits. He's the first of, of what's to come, the kingdom, meaning we too will get a resurrection. My parents would give us a gift on Christmas Eve, jammies mostly, but then, and I hated that. By the time you're 10, you know the whole gig, right? Just give me the jammies, take the picture, let's go to bed. Right? <laughs> but then every now and then she'd give us another little gift, uh, which was like a teaser for what was to come the next day like a first fruit, as it were. There's more to come, in other words. It's, it's a sign there's more to come. I have more for you, son. I have more for you, daughter. I love you more than you can imagine. I have so much more of my love to give to you. This is just a taste. The resurrection of the son has secured our future. You know, not only is Jesus resurrected, but he ascends. And between his resurrection and his ascension, he talks to his disciples. And among the many things he says is this, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, what? You may be also. You think he's lying? You think he's just, it's just rhetoric? Or do you think he has prepared a place for you so you can be with him? You think there's gonna be some vacancies in heaven? some empty rooms, I'm going to prepare a place for you. My resurrection and my Holy Spirit in your life is the first fruits, it's the, it's the first gift of what is to come, of my love. Apostle Paul again in Romans 8, verses 37 to 39, puts it this way. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I am sure 
that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a great verse. I'm convinced that there's nothing in creation, nothing you can think of, dream of, have experienced, or will experience that can ever separate you from the love of the Father that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The Son has conquered sin. He has conquered death. He has conquered the grave so that you would know you cannot be separated from his love. If you're in Christ, nothing you have done, are doing, or will do will take away his love for you. That doesn't mean he wants you to stay in your broken, messed up state. We like to say it's okay not to be okay around here. Just don't stay that way. It's not how God wants you to stay. His love transforms us. But the transforming power of his love is not you ought to do better. It's I love you perfectly. But you know, sometimes it's easier to believe God's love for other people, isn't it? Than it is for yourself. How many of you can relate to that? I have a friend who regularly prays for our church and prays for me. And this person came to me about the time that Pastor Brian and I were transitioning in leadership roles. My friend said to me, you know, I just feel like God wants you to know how much he loves you. And I was like, I'm a, yeah, duh, I'm a pastor, I know. <laughs> I know more verses about that than you do. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But part of me was like, yeah, I know that. You know, I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. And, she, and this person said, no, no, I just want you to, to, I think God just wants you to know, really know how much the Father loves you. I didn't let on in that moment, but I so needed to hear that. I grew up playing sports all my life. I was conditioned from a young age to think that my worth and my lovability was based on how well I did on the field or on the wrestling mat or wherever. Maybe you grew up in a performance culture. Maybe you grew up in a home where just love wasn't doled out very frequently by your parents. Or maybe you just have this part of you that's always trying to achieve. I think it's easier to believe, it's easier for me sometimes to believe God loves you for you than it is for me. Maybe you need to hear that this morning. The Father loves you. What is God like? What is the Father like? How could we know the God of the universe who dwells in infinite glory? How could we know him? What is he like? The Son shows you. He's patient. He's gracious. And he's loving Forever, everlasting, forever. You'll never, he'll never run out of patience for you. He'll never run out of grace for you. He doesn't get tired of you coming to him and go, this again, for the 200th time you're confessing this again, really? Like, okay, one more chance. That's not who God is. He's patient and he's gracious and he's loving forever and ever and ever. That is the message of Christmas. That is what we celebrate in a week. Not the cute baby in the manger, but the everlasting father would give himself, his own son, would not spare his son, and we can count on him to graciously give us all things. Let's bow. Father in heaven, we praise you that you have made yourself known to us by the son on earth, and you have given us your word. Thank you that you're not a God of our own invention, of our own minds, of, of our own image. You are a God so far beyond us, we can't even come up with analogies to understand you perfectly, and yet we can know you. We know you through the Son. And we thank you that among many things, Lord Jesus, you have made known to us the heart of the Father is patient, is gracious, and is loving forever. How we need your patience, grace, and love and how our world needs your patience, grace, and love. We thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.